So good to see you tonight. We'll make way over to Joshua chapter 3. If you found Joshua 3 verse 1, say amen. amen. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from the ancient grove, and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the, the Levites, bread of bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it of two thousand cubits by measure. Uh, do not come near it that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priest, saying, Take the ark of the covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt or magnify you in the sight of Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priest to bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord uh, your God. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for uh, the kindness that you've shown us today, Lord. And I, I, I really mean that, Lord. You have been so gracious, Lord, in the middle of uh, just one uh, wave of bad news after another today, Lord. And, and in the middle of it, Lord, I, none of it mattered, Lord, because I knew I was safely in your hands. Lord, I'm almost sure that that's the way it happened for a lot of people today, Lord, here among us, Lord. So we just thank you, Lord, for your kindness, Lord, for, again, asking you to protect our community, Lord, our church, Lord, from this Delta variant, Lord. I pray that you would keep our folks healthy, Lord. And as we have, uh, you know, take precautions, Lord, those who need to mask up, mask up, those who need to isolate themselves for a day or two, Lord. Let them do that, Lord. I pray there be wisdom in all of it, Lord. But mostly, I pray for your protection and your hedge around us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When you begin to come to this section of Joshua, you need to understand that the crossing of the Jordan was a very, very important thing. So important was the crossing of the Jordan that it takes three chapters to get it completely done. That is Joshua 3, 4, and 5. And, and at most times, uh, these three are considered together, but uh, I don't think we'll do that. We have plenty in each chapter, but I just want you to know that those three chapters are, are connected and serve as a pivotal point from those people coming out of the wilderness and pivoting in and coming into uh, the promised land. As a matter of fact, when they get ready to really cross over Jordan, all provision that had been given to them, uh, the, the clothes that didn't wear out, the, the manna from heaven, all this stuff ceased because they were to go and get it for themselves inside the promised land. You can appreciate that about the Lord. If you hadn't have it, if you hadn't got it and you need it and you can't get it, God bring it to you. If, if you ain't got it and you need it, God wants you to go out there and get it under his leadership and by faith with his hand. God's not ashamed to have his people work. You just need to know that. Amen. Never been any shame in work. God don't mind if we work. Uh, he's already decided that he's got a permanent rest plan for us in, in heaven. So uh, uh, if you wear yourself out down here doing his work and taking care of his business, uh, you will get a, a nice shade tree up in heaven with a hammock. It's just how that works out. Not that I really think there's shade trees and hammocks, okay? Uh, so Joshua comes and he gets up early. But if you're going to go to work for the Lord, Joshua, Yahshua, again, a type or shadow of Christ, Jesus having the same name as Joshua, and from the Latin to the Hebrew, uh, from the Aramaic to the Hebrew. So we saw Jesus oftentimes rising up early in the morning. 
uh, to go pray. We see Joshua getting up early in the morning to go about the business of God. And he tells them to set out from where they are to the Jordan. That's, a, that's about uh, 10 miles from where they are to where they need to go. And it takes this million and a half to two million people a whole day to get those 10 miles done. And when they get over there, they stop. It takes time to get this motley crew organize, organized into something that looks like a, a reasonable uh, fighting machine. So they get everybody moved, they get everything set up, and after a certain amount of time, the commanders go through the camp and they say, okay, uh, it's time to go over, and here is a signal for you to go over. You'll see the priest uh, going and carrying uh, the people over, you'll see them carrying the Ark of the Covenant and you need to follow them. And I want you to know that that's not normally where the Ark of the Covenant was. If you go back and reference uh, Deuteronomy and, and Leviticus, you'll find that, that the Ark of the Covenant rested in the center of the camp. It rested in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was in the center of the camp. They had four tribes surrounding each north, south, east, and west, and, and everybody could see the tabernacle, right? So when they moved, the Ark of the Covenant moved in the middle of, of, of the group that carried it, in the middle of the camp, in the middle of the group. And uh, it was there uh, because that's where the people need to know that God's presence was with them. That's what the Ark of the Covenant represented. It was about uh, three foot nine inches long, two foot uh, nine inches uh, wide and two foot nine inches high and then the top was made out of solid gold it was covered within without with gold and there on top were or uh, uh two cherubs that sat on each end and their wings you've seen it meet and right there where those wing tips are getting close to one another that is where the mercy seat of god was and that is where uh israel believed uh that god dwelt that was where he said it. That's where he was, and uh, it had all the relics in it. It had the ark. It had the, the covenant. It had the, the ten commandments. It had the walking staff of Aaron and the budding uh, staff, and all that was there. And it was there to signify, to signify God was with them. For this particular occasion, though, they were to tote this. Ark of the Covenant out from the middle of the people, from being in the presence of the people, out down the road about a mile ahead of the people. Joshua says you need to do this uh, because uh, you need to be careful to see the, the covenant because you've not passed this way before. Uh, and another reason is that, uh, so they could see it, right? The, all the children of Israel needed to see God leading the way. They needed to know that God was willing to not only be in their presence, but was willing to go with them and handle the business that was at hand. And that was to fully conquer uh, the land that he had offered to give them, if they would take it, if they would tread on it with their feet. They had to have faith that their God was going before them. Like us, that's how we possess anything God wants us to have, right? We possess salvation by faith. We possess uh, the goodness of God, the things that we have in our house by, by faith, we possess the things we claim in our prayers by faith, right? We, we ask the Lord to hedge around us again tonight, uh, particularly protect us from this uh, new variant of COVID. So by faith, we possess the fact that God is hedging around us, not only as a church as a whole, but individual members so that we can be protected. So if you're going to do anything, God must go before you because you hadn't gone that way before and you must possess it by faith. So everybody needs to see God's presence leading off. So that's one of the great distance we see there. Then we look down and verse 5 in the Bible says uh, that Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourself. And uh, that's to consecrate yourself. He's saying, y'all need to wash up. Now, it was not easy to get a million and a half to two million people to bathe, especially when they didn't have hot and cold running water, right? Uh, there wasn't a lot of bathhouse facilities like in Marlin County grounds. 
But it was important for them to bathe. For the Jewish people, for them to bathe or sanctify or consecrate themselves, to wash their clothes and to wash themselves, was signifying an outwardness of what was happening inside their heart. Remember King David when he was confronted with his sin by the prophet and and confessed his sin before God with his adulterous uh, affair with Bathsheba, the Bible says that he goes and he cleans himself up. He washes himself, puts on new clothes, and he gets ready to concentrate himself to God. This is an outward sign that these people are ready to, to be holy, right? God wants a holy instrument going into that promised land. God wants us to be holy. The whole idea uh, that we find uh, uh, in uh, 1 Peter, when 1 Peter says, Be ye holy, even as your Father in heaven is holy. That's the whole idea that we see here. So, you have got to see where God's going. Give Him the room to operate. Right? You've got to see what He's doing. A lot of times we rush into things and we don't see what God's doing. We don't pay attention. Remember, Jesus said his father was always at work. <laughs> so he's just going and working where his father works, if you'll remember what he said that in the book of John. So we need to see where God's going. So we let him take the lead. And we need to get ourselves in a right shape and mind frame to follow after him wherever he would go. So then he says that to the people. Then he pulls the priests aside in kind of a huddle. And he says, take the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you or magnify you uh, in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. This again, remember this book is written to Joseph, uh, Joshua. God is talking to Joshua. You'll find a lot of people who uh, say that God's exalting him and magnifying him. Well, they can't get it from here unless Jesus Christ mediates that for them. God will magnify, God will exalt you, but you must humble yourself. If you humble yourself under the hand of God, He will exalt you in due time. Again, First Peter. So, here, this specific thing for Joshua was, you are the leader, but now I'm going to make sure that people understand just what kind of leader you are. You're the same kind of leader that was going to be invested with the power and the knowledge and the wisdom that Moses had. Remember, you're not just the law giver, Joshua. You're the law fulfiller. Your, uh, your ministry will actually supersede Moses. Now, nobody believes that. We don't see that. Everybody wants everybody to be like Moses. But look, God gets all his work done, all of his work done through Joshua. Conquering lands and waging war and, and uh, having military strategy, that's, that's a lot of work and that's a lot of strategy and that's, uh, that's got to be a lot of faith because uh, remember the first conquest? Now what kind of battle are they going to fight when they take the wall of Jericho? Anybody? They're going to pull out Tommy guns and throw rocks at them? No. No, what do they do? Anybody? They shout. They shout. They shot at the wall. You know, unconventional warfare, if you will. So Joshua is going to be exalted and people are going to see that when Joshua speaks, he speaks for the Lord and they need to follow after him because God's working something out through Joshua. Um, by the way, same reason you need to listen to Jesus because God's working out something through his son. Verse 8. You shall command the priest to bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you come to the edge of the water of Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. All right? Okay, that sounds great. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, I don't know what ites those are, the Amorites and the Jebusites. So by what he's saying, by what's fixing to happen, this is going to be a sign that this, that's fixing to happen is a sign that what he said was going to happen 
and the country and the land was going to be able to happen. The same God who's able to do this, nothing's too hard, nothing's too difficult for him. These other things are well in your hand. Again, not only magnifying Joshua, but also building confidence in God himself for the people. He said, Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into Jordan. Now, you might want to underline this. You will not see this. You will not see this spoken before anywhere else. This is the first time we see this. The Lord of all the earth. Now, Rahab had already understood that, that the Lord is the God of all heaven and earth. We read that last week. She's already decided she's going to follow this. But this is the first time that, that they're really concentrating. Joshua is really saying this about the Lord. This is not some kind of tribal deity, right? Every one of these tribes had their own personal localized God. Uh, they had uh, they had the uh, idol mark. You just go down there, order up your idol, they carve it out and overlay it with gold, silver, brass, whatever it was. And you just fall down and worship with $99 uh, dollars like the Earl uh, what Shysters. Uh, car paint shop. What was that? Paint your car for $99. Y'all remember those? That's what you would get. No, this is not some kind of tribal deity. No way, Jose. This is the same God who was able, able to overcome the over 200 deities of, of, of Egypt. This is Him. This is a worldwide, world changing God. He's already proved this in the last chapter because He's. He went in and found him a Gentile convert. And so we see him carrying out a convert uh, in, uh, in the Rahab, loving on the Gentiles, showing mercy. This is it. He says, this is the God who's going over before you. Now therefore, take yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from each tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest who bear the Ark of the Covenant the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the water of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, and the water shall come down from upstream, and they shall stand in a heap. Now, think about this. Jordan has a particular name about itself. It's called the descender. It's because it comes off the mountain so fast and has so much, so many rapids and all that kind of stuff that the water is really moving. The current is really fast through there. So there is water coming down fast. And he says it's going to be standing up in a heap. It's going to be compressed together somewhere. So it was when the people set out from their camp across over Jordan that the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And those who bore the Ark of, uh, came to Jordan and the feet of the priest who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water. Now you have to appreciate that, right? They don't have to wait out there and get their skirts all messed up. The sand was going to get a little toe, the sand was going to get a little water on it, but that's about it. That's how powerful God is. He don't want nobody to catch cold. <laughs> so he don't keep their, their skirts dry. So, and watch this. For the Jordan overflows all of its banks during the whole time of harvest. Now, notice the time of the year, right? Normally, uh, it's said that the Jordan is anywhere from 50 to 60 yards wide. Not so when the flood comes down. It could be as many as a mile wide in a lot of places because of snow that's melting off the top of uh, out of the mountains of Lebanon. So, you know, the Lord just don't want anybody to think that, uh, you know, nothing's too difficult to him. Whether it, was, whether it was dry or whether it was wet, they were still going over. God says, this is a good day as any. Uh, so they overflowed. They Verse 16 says that the water which came down the stream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam. Anybody remember what the word Adam means? What's Adam stand for? Anybody? Genesis. Man, you're exactly right. Isn't it funny? Right? I mean, that's just in there for our enjoyment. At man. <laughs> there it stands up. That's some 30 miles away. From where they're at. So the waters went down to the sea of Arab, and the salt sea fell and were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho, right? Can you imagine? They see them camping over there. Now, Jericho is somewhere close by the Jordan. 
And I'm sure, remember, we already know that there's some kind of counter espionage going on because they saw the men come in to Rahab. So there's still somebody out there watching what's going on. And they all bottled up and not for sure exactly how they're going to get across, right? The children of Israel don't know that Joshua tells them. Joshua doesn't know that the Lord tells him. And all of a sudden, the water, 30 miles down the road, can you, uh, you, know, can you imagine how the folks around the town of Adam was feeling that day? What, what in the world is going on in the wide, wide world of sports? A little Blazing Saddles reference, if you remember the movie. So, uh, there is a, um, a dry ground, a scared city, and an amazed people watching their Lord work. Because not only has the Lord went before them, but now they're in the middle of Jordan, and now He's back in their midst. See that? You think the Lord's way out there? Uh-uh. You think he's working out there, but he's right there beside you. He's always in your midst. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. That's the kind of God he is. Then the priest who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood uh, firm on the ground in the midst of the Jordan. All of Israel crossed over on the dry ground until the people had crossed completely over Jordan. So, God goes before them, God ends up in the midst, and God stays there until the work is done. You can appreciate that about your Lord. That's all I got about that.